Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. So check-ins. Uh, yeah, I feel like, uh, I don't know if it's nervousness. It has a different quality to nervousness. And whatever word you'd want to put on that, it's about 10%, maybe 15%. Um, I'm feeling playful, like I want to kind of tickle Justin in an inappropriate way. Um, and beyond that, my wife just made me a delicious hamburger and I'm feeling a little sluggish. So welcome to the STOA. I am Peter Limberg, the steward of the STOA. And the STOA is a place for us to cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this moment. And we are very lucky today to have the based philosophical badass himself, Justin Murphy. And um, yeah, Justin first came on my radar like a couple of years ago. He was like talking about like having sex with dead bodies. And I was like, this guy kind of like looks like me. But of course, like better looking and more intelligent and whatnot. But I'm like, okay, this, this guy's pretty cool. And I've been following his career and it was, it was a pretty delicious career to follow. And so me and him have been trading um, emails back and forth to get each other on each other's like podcasts and whatnot. And we never had made it happen. So we made it happen. Um, and I'm also part of his indie thinkers community, which is quite awesome. So definitely check that out. And hopefully he'll, he'll maybe plug it uh, near the end. So I'm going to hand it over to our MC for the day, uh, for the Q&A, Raven, the lovely Raven. So Raven, if you can uh, take it from here. Thank you, Peter. So as per usual, we will have Justin speak about uh, the cynical enlightenment. I am very excited to hear what you have to say about this uh, for about 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll move into question and answer period. I'll warm Justin up or Peter and I will warm Justin up with some questions and then we'll be taking questions from the audience. And then today at the, once the session is over, we're actually gonna do another like sense-making session for this where we'll go into breakout rooms and just talk freely about uh, the different ideas that came up in the session. So looking forward to that as well. And with that, Justin, unmute yourself, sir. <laughs> manage my time and uh if it's not too much to ask if you wanted to maybe give me like a five minute warning at the five minute mark uh that'd be good but if not that's okay too i'll set it for i'll set it for 20 minutes and uh that's good to know i can have 25 if need be i'll aim for 20. cool right. sounds great awesome well first of all i'd like to thank peter for the invitation i'm truly grateful and i'm sincerely happy to be here you know at first when peter invited me i I demurred actually because I've spoken with Peter a couple times privately and he's a very calm and balanced man. And you know, I'm, I'm just not, I'm, I'm prone to terrible bouts of enthusiasm and well, you know, my haters would call that narcissism and uh, perhaps they're right to some degree. And frankly, honestly, I didn't want to blemish Peter's, what I'm sure is a very healthy discussion group here unless I was confident that I really had something valuable to offer. And that's honestly why I kind of ignored Peter's invitation for a few weeks. And so then I dragged my feet, but then an idea came to me and I emailed Peter and I said, let's do it. And so I thought that what I might offer to a venue called the STOA is a set of reflections on a particular lineage or tradition within which stoicism sits. And I think it's not a very well-known tradition or lineage. In fact, as far as I know, it's never really been formally diagnosed in any published literature that I'm aware of. So I will be presenting a somewhat uh, novel or original hypothesis today. And I only have 20 minutes. So um, needless to say, it's going to be limited to hypotheses and assertions, which I'm not going to be able to fully convince you of or fully justify, but I can at least lay them out there for you. And you can take them or leave them and we can discuss them. And so I would call this tradition or lineage the cynical enlightenment. Although really we should spell that with a K and not a C. This is a very confusing subpoint, which I won't get bogged down in, but basically the term cynicism as we know it today means something totally different than what I'm going to talk about. It has to do with a kind of weird kind of historical, a set of historical inversions really. I, I'll give you the backstory real quick. Um, at the time of the ancient cynics, people like Diogenes of Sinope, the, the haters of Diogenes would call Diogenes kinikos with a K or it had that hard sound to it. 
And um, that's actually one of the roots for what we now call cynicism, has that hard, that hard K sound. And what it meant at the time was dog-like. That's technically what, what it meant in ancient Greek. In, ancient, in the ancient Greek, dog-like. So it was an insult. It was an attack on Diogenes for acting and living like a dog. So it's that dog-like sense of cynicism, rather kinicism, that I'm going to be talking about today. And it's not what you think of when you think of uh, soft C cynicism in, in the way that that's used today. So just a bit of a clarification before we begin. And I think that just the main thesis I'm going to offer you today is simply what I take to be the main thesis of this tradition, the kind of underlying implicit argument or idea that I think characterizes this, this long running tradition. And then I'll give you a very rapid fire narrative of what exactly that historical tradition involves, the main figures I think it involves. And this is where I might confuse many of you because I, I'm going to give you a lineup of thinkers that you've probably never heard put in one lineup before. And it's going to go from the beginning with Socrates all the way up to uh, kind of post-1968 uh, left libertarian radical politics in Western societies. So that's my kind of overarching vision, and I'm going to kind of just take you through these arguments and this historical tradition uh, really, really rapidly. Obviously, I'm going to be condensing and simplifying like crazy. So if anything I say seems way too quick or insufficient, it probably is, right? I'm just trying to pack as much as I can into a fun and hopefully stimulating 20-minute talk. So, all right, I'll start with the major thesis, I would say, or the underlying core idea of what I'm calling the cynical enlightenment or rather cynical enlightenment. And it's something like this. I'll present it to you as a, as a very simple kind of syllogism. The idea is that social group cohesion requires falsehoods, almost by definition, necessarily. If you have a group that is persisting over time, that group is going to tell itself certain lies. We see this in very mundane examples, right? This is not a very provocative or sophisticated argument. Just think about everyday small talk, right? Think about everyday niceties. Think about the people you live with, your partners, your roommates, whatever it might be. To get on with people, right? You have to kind of uh, agree to overlook certain things, right? And in a controlled small scale way, that's very healthy, right? Um, this is good. Uh, it's, it's nice to do this. It's kind to do this. And, and it is genuinely good for for it for group cohesion, for, for getting along, for having a community. It's necessary. And so that's at one level of analysis, though. That's at one scale at which it's obviously, you know, the right thing to do to not constantly be uh, looking for every little truth you possibly can about the people around you in your community. Uh, that would clearly become quite uh, unhappy quite quickly. Now, the problem is, though, when you have the falsehoods that hold together uh, social groups play out over time at larger scales, this actually becomes uh, one of the core problems of, of complex societies. And I would even argue, and I see as implicit in this tradition, the idea that as society becomes more complex, precisely what is most bad or evil about large societies is essentially rooted in these falsehoods that have their source in kind of social niceties and social cohesion, okay? And so, ergo, social groups, it's eventually realized, are on some level invested in evils that they don't fully understand. Because of these kind of small-scale compromises we have to make with the truth to get along with each other, those kind of blossom or, or balloon into these complex circuits of, of hypocrisy and deceit. And this becomes the, the kind of festering ground for so much of what we now uh, see as uh, so horrible and problematic about, uh, about any kind of complex society, whether that be inequality or injustice or the perpetuation of propaganda, all of these things that it's very common uh, for people today to, to, to lament about complex societies. Th there is a realization in this tradition I'm calling the clinical enlightenment that everything that's wrong with complex societies is essentially rooted in these small micro dishonesties uh, that we that we submit to in our everyday re interactions for the sake of of what is essentially social pressures of getting along in a community okay and so the final implication of this perspective is that ergo one should 
live and act, or at least some people within society, and perhaps a tiny minority within society, needs to live and to act in a way that looks and is ra rather radically antisocial. And they have to do that in a way that involves speaking the truth recklessly. That there, there, there is this realization running from Socrates all the way up to, you know, uh, Western left liberalism in kind of the late 20th century that that kind of has always intuited this, this fact that to to really get under and break up the the falsehoods and dishonesties that that structure our society, you need at least a small number of people who quite recklessly are just going out into the world and saying all of those things you're not supposed to be saying, which by definition make that person an asshole by definition saying these things. Uh, you're, it's not just that you appear to be unreasonable or you appear to be mean or nasty or, or gross or perverse or whatever negative adjective you can come up with. It's not just that you seem like that. You actually are. You actually have to bite the bullet, that you are actually engaged in what is essentially antisocial behavior. And, and so that's the tradition. That's the main thesis of this tradition. It's, I, presented, I presented to you today as a kind of syllogism, a set of uh, realizations uh, followed by a kind of implication for, for social action as having an essentially redemptive value. Okay, and what I'll do just now is kind of go very rapid fire through some of the, the, the milestones in this tradition. And maybe before I do that very briefly, I wanna just point out one other little watchword, if you will, of this tra tradition, a, a particular concept that you actually see emerge in, in the literature um, as I'm going to kind of uh, piece it together for you. And it's this concept of parisia. I've talked about this a few times, I've given some talks on this, I've written about it, and uh, it's something I've been, I've been very interested in for a long time. This, this is a Greek word, and it's often translated into English as uh, frank speech. And uh, by the way, there's a really good book by Foucault, probably Foucault's, the, the best book by Foucault is called The Courage of Truth. And it's pretty much an analysis of, of Parisia, the concept of Parisia in the, in the ancient world. And um, so this is kind of the watchword that actually was used by multiple people in this tr tradition that I'm about to, to tell you about. Uh, Diogenes also had a similar concept called defacing the currency. I think it's essentially the same thing. Okay, and I've talked actually at some length in other talks and, and I've written also a little bit about the mechanisms of Parisia, like what exactly is required for Parisia to, to function. I talk about this in the Base Deleuze lectures, for instance, so I'm not going to go into that here. I'm going to focus on uh, kind of expanding out the, the historical narrative, okay? So, so it all starts with Socrates, in my understanding. Most of you know the, the famous stories of, of Socrates. Uh, this is required reading and in uh, many universities today, you, we all know that Socrates was put to trial uh, for corrupting the youth. And you know, Socrates' MO was he, what did he do? He walked around and asked people really annoying questions all of the fucking time, and he wouldn't stop. They called him a gadfly. And ultimately, you know, if you simply go around society asking uh, difficult questions a little too frequently, that really does become a crime. That's kind of the lesson of Socrates. Uh, it's kind of interesting that it ultimately gets diagnosed as corrupting the youth, which is actually somewhat, you know, we can, th we can think of some interesting kind of contemporary analogies to that. It's like, uh, I won't go into that, but um, yeah. So, so if you ask too many questions too annoyingly, uh, you, you actually really are a, a kind of public enemy. And as we see in the case of Socrates, that is often weirdly linked to, to um, some sort of, touching some sort of sacred thing. And, and, and the youth has always been a kind of uh, sacred space that, that, that no reasonable adult should, should have anything to do with corrupting the youth, right? So that's Socrates, right? It's we all know that story. So that's an obvious kind of form of Parisia. Uh, and, and people hated him for it. And, and, and they essentially put him to death for it. Um, a lesser known figure in, the, in the, the golden age of ancient Greece is Diogenes. Diogenes is this amazing, extraordinary character. Many of you might've heard me talk about him elsewhere. Uh, he basically engaged in these kind of extraordinary provocative public acts. He, act, he basically acted like an animal. And it, it's really quite bizarre if you look over the anecdotes, the types of things he would do, like masturbate in public, or, you know, he one time uh, took a shit on the stage of, the, of, of what were essentially the, the kind of uh, Olympic games at that time in ancient Greece. And he basically was what we would now today call a performance artist. I mean, just a wild man who would go out doing extremely weird, provocative things just to uh, 
prove a point, really. And he also lived a very simple life. So he kind of put his money where his mouth was. He lived out of a barrel and uh, had very few needs, really. He kind of, he, he, he ate very simply. Uh, he relied on nothing, had almost no objects or belongings and uh, was very isolated socially also. So he didn't have many friends, but he was able to kind of, uh, speak the truth, but not just speak the truth, live the truth in a kind of provocative way. And, and I think the best way to understand Diogenes is that his target was kind of bourgeois hypocrisy, right? Because, you know, ancient Greece is kind of the, the beginning of, of Western civilization as we know it. So there are starting to emerge some, some comforts, right? Some luxuries uh, and kind of lifestyle comforts. And with that, with kind of bourgeois comfort, there's always hypocrisy. Uh, and he was basically trying to call out Greek society on, on its hypocrisies. Maybe it's worth pausing for a minute. If that's not absolutely obvious what I mean by how hypocrisy or falsehood is kind of baked into civilization itself. I'll pause on that real quick. I think the, the best way to think about that is just the concept of manners, right? What are manners? Uh, manners are essentially a kind of deception where you actively try to present yourself in a way that is other than what you naturally are inclined to present yourself, right? So it's a kind of really, really uh, kind of subliminal, uh, uh, di how should I say, um, uh, kind of diffuse, diffuse form of lying, essentially. And so he's kind of attacking Western hypocrisy at its core uh, when we're first starting to develop these kind of pretenses and kind of bodily forms of lying. Okay, and so he's, he's just attacking these. And this is what a true philosopher does. Just like Socrates asked too many questions, he refused to, he refused to stop in search for the truth. Uh, same thing with Diogenes, but Diogenes took it to a new level because for him it was performative. He was actually engaging in, in activities that were performatively provocative. So I see it, Diogenes is kind of learning from the mistake of Socrates. Uh, Diogenes is like, I'm not gonna get put to death for asking the youth too many questions. I'm just going to do crazy ass shit and it's going to get the point across whether they like it or not. And it's harder to punish them for. And in fact, Diogenes was really quite clever because there actually was a real political advantage to his techniques relative to Socrates because uh, not only did Diogenes avoid getting put to death like Socrates uh, unfortunately failed to avoid, uh, but he, he was quite powerful because of it. Alexander the Great, for instance, is famous for having said that if he could not be Alexander, he would wish to be Diogenes. It's rather extraordinary, right? So it's a, it's a real testimony to the, the real empirical mechanisms of, of Parisia as actual political activity that really does change distributions of power in a certain way. Okay, and so next up comes Jesus Christ and the Stoics, which are, you know, both, both of these kind of phenomena are, are very close in time. Uh, so it's a little difficult actually to tease out which is causing which. But um, one thing that you all might know about the Stoics is that or you might not know, uh, is that the stoicism is one way to understand sto stoicism as it emerges is that it's kind of a kind of uh, embourgeoisement is, is one way of putting it of uh, cynicism, of ancient cynicism, a kind of becoming uh, bourgeois of, of ancient cynicism. Because as you know, the, pe the great stoics, like people like Marcus Aurelius, these were governors, right? These, Marcus Aurelius was, was a Roman emperor. And, and stoicism was a kind of uh, polished up cleaned up version of what Diogenes really introduced with cynicism. And that's well documented in the literature. That's not just me saying that. There, there's a clear kind of inheritance there. Okay, but the main difference being that uh, it, Marcus Aurelius and people like that fit the insight of Diogenes in a way that works for rulers and governors, okay? So um, that's, that's an important little mutation there. But Jesus Christ also is essentially participating in the same tradition. There's, there's a really good passage in uh, the Gospels of Mark, for instance, where Jesus actually uses the word parisia. Um, he, it's when he's, he's basically at the time, uh, I think it's Peter at the time, is saying to Jesus, um, hey, you know, we like your message and all, but you maybe don't need to run around letting all of the governors hear you saying that, right? Because you know they're going to kill you, right? Um, so Peter's kind of like, you can say all of this, it's great, you should develop this and we should organize around this great idea you have, Jesus, but maybe just don't go out of your way to let the government hear you saying it. Um, and what Jesus says in response is, no, that's part of the point, that's part of the project here. And he invokes this word parisia. Um, so so it's, really, it's really quite fascinating. I, I really do think there's gospel evidence that Jesus had some kind of conscious, uh, real, con a kind of conscious participation in this lineage that goes from Socrates to Diogenes up to Jesus and, and, the, Sto and the Stoics. And, 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 and of course, people like Marcus Aurelius, um, I, I'm, I'm quite confident, would have some sort of awareness of this tradition, but they were governors and they had to kind of make it respectable. And, and, and they, they significantly modified uh, the, the implications of ancient kinicism for, you know, to make it fit for rulers. Okay, so uh, just to kind of move forward a little bit more rapidly, 
And this is where uh, my diagnosis, I think, becomes somewhat idiosyncratic. This is where maybe a lot of scholars uh, who are very familiar with these different uh, historical periods might kind of raise their eyebrows at me. So I'll, I'll just give you that kind of um, honest uh, caveat there. But then again, that's in part you have to keep in mind because just very few scholars do this kind of truly kind of cross historical type of analysis. So I'm just being honest with you that I, I'm not aware of any kind of uh, scholarship that, that at, the, at this moment supports what I'm saying, but I'll make the case to you. Um, I'm going to fast forward a lot, uh, in part because of my own historical blind spots. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not very familiar with much work from, from the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages. Uh, but one figure I am quite familiar with is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And I see Rousseau as this kind of extraordinary reinvention of this Parisiastic tradition. Uh, I don't know how much you know about Rousseau's life, but a truly, truly extraordinary intellectual figure. And say what you want about his ideas and whether they're true or false or good or bad, but as, as a biography, it, it, he's an extraordinary example of a truly committed radical intellectual, a man who uh, clearly was going to give his whole life to thinking the truth as well as he could and expressing it as fearlessly and as radically in, in a political way as he possibly could, uh, no matter what might befall him. He basically spent most of his life on the run from various uh, governments, actually, uh, and often in debt, uh, you know, had this kind of really wild life where he basically just always prioritized his ideas, developing his ideas and publishing his ideas, constantly getting into trouble for them and constantly running away from uh, whoever was out to get him. Often, you know, I'm talking about like actual kings and queens of, of multiple countries. He was banned from multiple countries and, and, and he was wanted by, by multiple authorities. Um, and so, uh, without going into Rousseau's ideas too much, all I'll say is that if you look at how he practiced his ideas and many things he said also, um, his autobiography in particular, uh, Rousseau, you might not know this, basically invented the modern autobiography. It wasn't really a thing until, until the idea of setting out on paper a long series of kind of comprehensive soul searching reflections about one's life. No one ever really did that. And he, and he did it in this big way. And he went specifically hard on trying to find things that were embarrassing, things that were kind of shameful. And um, of course, another, another example would be uh, St. Augustine, right, who, who, who's kind of known for also talking about things like masturbating, right? So, so there are other kind of figures I'm, I'm skipping a little bit. But Rousseau um, had, seemed to have this insight that if he could simply be as radically honest about himself as possible, if he could find all of his own hypocrisies, all of his own evil, by essentially introspection and, and basically sh just shamelessly and, and selflessly uh, laying bare all that is kind of evil in his own feelings and aspirations and psychology, he had this idea that that would be kind of so explosive that it could really lead to, to cultural progress rapidly, that it could have revolutionary uh, political implications for making the world more equal and more free. And, and this actually works. I mean, again, I'm really interested in empirical mechanisms. And if you look at the influence of Rousseau, it was extraordinary, right? Oh, sorry about that. So I'll, I'll finish it up in five minutes. Um, five minutes max, I mean. I'll try to be quicker than that. And so uh, Rousseau uh, has this kind of crazy idea and, and lives this crazy life of, of philosophical kind of uh, uh, self-punishing in some way. And it actually does have profound effects because lo and behold, the French Revolution uh, is well documented as as flowing in in large part from the ideas of of Rousseau. Uh, many of the leading French revolutionaries were in fact influenced by Rousseau, and and, and there's documentary evidence of this. Okay, so uh, in some ways, in, in some ways, th th what I'm talking about, it's really not just abstract ideas. It's 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 a kind of uh, mental model of how public philosophy works. That, as far as I can tell in history actually does produce real ripple ripples in the social fabric okay and 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 rousseau is just kind of one of the more recent uh kind of modern examples in some ways rousseau kind of opens up the, the modern period culturally and politically okay and so i'm gonna just really fast fo forward through through the next few but just to put it on the map for you um i many of you will know that i'm i'm at the time quite interested in uh gilles deleuze and i think in his own interesting weird way deleuze is also participating in this tradition because uh, Deleuze actually was quite interested in Stoicism, and he cites the Stoics uh, quite frequently in, his, in, in many of his books, actually. And I talk about in my book on Deleuze, I talk about uh, his interesting relationship to Christianity. I think Deleuze is actually much more Christian than, than people realize. As I'm saying now, he's, he's more Stoic than, than many people realize. And finally, I would argue that 
the kind of 1968 moment, for those of you who don't know, 1968 was this kind of extraordinary revolutionary period. Uh, millions of people went on general strike in France, for instance, and a lot of people in 1968 genuinely believed that Western, Western societies were actually going through uh, legitimate economic and political social revolutions. And um, I would argue that there is to this day a kind of latent left libertarian revolutionary politics that has not really been fully explored yet. This is my politics that I'm interested in. This is as far as I see the world, as far as my beliefs go, my politics or my ideology I mean, I think intellectuals should try to have no ideology, but to the degree that I have one, to the degree I have a politics, it's this kind of subterranean, hiding, latent, radical, left, libertarian, uh, parisiastic politics. And I think you can draw a straight line from Socrates all the way up through all of these people to envision what it might look like for us to speak and think and live and act in a way that has a kind of left libertarian flavor or style, but it essentially seizes on Parisia as a form of revolutionary political action. And that to this day is what I'm mostly interested in. And in my own way, that's, that's, that's the, the, the philosophy that I'm trying to figure out and live with my own life. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. That was very dense and super exciting. So um, I'm going to invite people to put their questions in the chat. I just initially would love for you to kind of uh, break apart each of the words in what you just said. So latent left libertarian, you kind of got into latent, but you, can you describe more of like what left libertarian means to you and how you're embodying that uh, tradition in your own life? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, frankly, I wouldn't want any of this to get too bogged down in left and right. I think it's it's super epiphenomenal. And I think there's so much confusion around it right now that I would almost rather just do away with it. But to answer your question, I mean, what, I, what I'm essentially suggesting is that this spirit I've, I've characterized for you, this Parisiastic spirit, I do think that it has a kind of intrinsically left wing flavored uh, vibe to it because it is essentially a kind of insurrectionary attitude. It's a kind of insurrectionary ethos and it's militating against injustice uh, in a kind of provocative, disruptive and radical way. So I, I'd say that that most clearly aligns with what we today think of as as a leftist kind of ethos. And but but it's it's quite I'm saying it's latent, meaning hidden or not yet cultivated. It's not yet revealed to use a kind of Heideggerian phrasing, if you will. Uh, it's, it's, it's latent or hiding simply because of accidental contingent factors of, of the public culture today. And I think the only way you really kind of reveal it or unconceal it is through this kind of what appears to be a kind of radically antisocial type of, of activity. And I'm trying to kind of show you all or make the argument that sometimes you might see certain performances that appear nasty or mean or, or unreasonable or antisocial, but in fact, you might want to support that type of thing. You might want to encourage more of that. That might be exactly what we're lacking today. Excellent. Peter, I see you have some questions. Would you like to ask? Yes. Uh, first, I, I love that talk, man. That was brilliant. And um, I'm really appreciative too of you coming in, like being really considered, like talking about something about stoicism. Most people come in and just talk about whatever the fuck they want to talk about. So <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, so the question of this Parisia thing, and maybe we can put like a more norm, normy term to it, like revolutionary truthfulness, if you will. And then you used, uh, um, you mentioned reckless truthfulness. I'm wondering if there could be two versions of this revolutionary truthfulness, one that is a reckless version and one that is wreckful, like a wreck, if, if I can use a tortured word, like wreckful truthfulness. Do you think that's a possibility? It's definitely possible, but my instinct is that the, the conscious careful version of Parisia is precisely the government version. It's the ruler's version. And, and, and that's essentially going to have a kind of conservative disposition. And perhaps you're right, Peter, perhaps there are times and places for both. And maybe that is the most pr productive way to think about it. But what I would argue is that there's, we have a lot of this kind of conservative Parisia going on right now, because we have a lot of elites who say one thing in private, and they say another thing in public. This is, this is all over the place. Um, and I think I think that kind of conservative or careful Parisia, uh, it, it, it doesn't have the same kind of disruptive, uh, progressive function. Um, it's often, it often can be a kind of selfishness uh, with a kind of pro-social gloss, right? It's like, okay. I, I, I know what I really think, but I don't want to talk about it in public because it's going to hurt people's feelings. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it's framed as like, I want to be good to society. I want to be nice. I don't want to be a bad person. So I'm going to keep what I really think in my head. Whereas in fact, that's a, that's a very selfish uh, kind of rationalization 
which is what's really going on is that person wants to maintain their own security and comfort and control with the truths that they know. And they're not willing to take the, they're not willing to pay the cost, the, the social opprobrium of really putting it out there in public. So, so here, let me see if I can yes and that. Um, so one, like, I really like this idea, like this, like sort of like the noble lie of keeping these white lies, right? That helps this uh, social cohesion. Yes. Um, and it's like one case in point, I've been talking about this lately. It's like, especially in the work world. It's like, how are you doing today? I'm good. Like, what the fuck does that mean? Right? No, no one's good. Like I'm, I'm like, I'm on a roller coaster of emotions these days. And I'm just, one of them's not good. Um, but it's just a word to just kind of like the nice and ease. So you inst can instrumentalize the person for whatever the fuck you want to instrumentalize them for. Um, so that's just like one example why we're telling each other these, these like white lies. But so I don't know if you know this, that uh, I'm a, I was a trainer, or I'm, I'm still a trainer in the Dale Carnegie training, the How to Win Friends and Influence People. We've been around for 100 years. So it's all about social fluency and shit like that. And there's something called metacommunication, where you, uh, not just talking about the content, where you can jump outside of the content and talk about the, maybe the asymmetrical intentions that are involved in that conversation. And then you can call it out in such a way that it's tactful and you allow the other person to save face and they don't get triggered. And then you can put them and yourself at the edge of your thinking together but you have to have that kind of social tact in order to do so. And so that's what I guess what I'm gesturing towards for a potential of wreckful truthfulness. Okay. I like that. Yeah. I didn't know uh, Dale Carnegie was so based, but that works. He's I not. think that's cool. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think this is an interesting avenue for research and for experimentation, kind of figuring out micro tactics where people can uh, kind of uh, explore this frontier of of reckless truth telling, but in in clever ways that perhaps don't need to be as as explosive and as and as crazy as as someone like Diogenes. There could totally be a whole menu of of tactics and strategies for uh, introducing this type of, of 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 style to your life and, and this type of of adventure without being as crazy as Diogenes. And perhaps you just cited one example. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the seduction comes to mind. Um... But maybe it's a conversation we can bookmark for another time. So I'll take Raven back in for the, the Q&A. Cool. Yeah, Justin, I'm kind of wondering, like, uh, there seems to be some sort of dispositional, like, thing going on here as well. Like, uh, especially these characters in history where they had to incur such a high cost for, for taking these radical positions. Uh, I mean, especially Socrates, right? So, and I, I, and I think, like, especially on the internet, there are people who are just kind of antagonistic, uh, who just find each other and are just being kind of outrageous. I think uh, Ron mentioned this in, in like a immature kind of um, disagreeableness versus like a mature kind of disagreeableness. Do you have anything to say in terms of like uh, being sure that you're being truthful? Because there's so many levels of delusion possible. Like you may go after some sort of idea uh, or some sort of consensus without even uh, examining yourself uh, in terms of whether or not you're really being honest? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. And I think you're absolutely right that there's a lot of cultural activity going on right now, which might even fancy itself as having this kind of clinical uh, kind of quality to it. But in fact, it's just uh, seething bad faith and resentment uh, playing itself out in kind of destructive circles. And yeah, I think there is a uh, very, a very difficult line to walk um, uh, in the in the Christian tradition. This is, you know, why they call it the straight and narrow path. It's hard, right? You, there are pitfalls on both sides. In the Deleuzian register, it's it's like um, how he talks about deterritorialization, and and uh, he talks about at, 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 he's at pains to point out that uh, there, there's kind of pitfalls on both sides. It's this really difficult, uh, delicate balance that you have to walk. And um, so I completely agree. I think that's a, that's a huge question, a huge problem. I'm not sure that I have a, an amazingly impressive solution to the puzzle, but I can say I can say one or two things. One is that uh, there's a really, really amazing book, probably I think one of my favorite philosophy books I've ever read in my life uh, by Peter Sloterdijk uh, uh, called uh, The Critique of Cynical Reason. And uh, it's, if you're interested in the stuff I'm talking about with cynicism and kinicism, it's pretty much the best place to go. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a massive book. Uh, it's an extraordinarily interesting and complicated kind of theoretical historical tale that he tells about the evolution of cynicism. And uh, it's where I learned most of what I know about cynicism. So most of what I told you today about cynicism kind of came from that book. And I think one would need to reread that book. I think that book has answers to this question, but, but in short, it's something to the effect that um, 
kinesism has kinesism and modern cynicism have this weirdly uh, kind of volatile character where it's very easy for kinesism to flip into cynicism. And I think something like that is going on with the kind of uh, uh, resentful, uh, bitter, destructive kind of uh, trolling uh, truth telling that you see on the internet today. Uh, to be a little bit more specific, uh, just to try to give you something of concrete value and not just hand wave uh, like I kind of am up until now, I would say one characteristic that, that is a pretty reliable uh, differentiator between resentful, trolling, cynicism, and truth-telling, radical kinicism would be um, paying a price under your own name. So if you look at some of the worst behavior online right now, it's by anonymous people. It's by trolls, right? And there's this big debate in the kind of radical intellectual circles of like, should you, go, should you write on the internet under your own name or should you write on the internet under an anonymous or pseudonymous name? And I think this is, this is a really concrete uh, answer to your, to your question because I think so long as you are writing under your own name or so long as you are speaking under your own name and you are paying the price for what you say and what you do, it's much more likely to be the real kind of kinesism that we want more of. Whereas if you're insulated and it's only some pseudonym on the internet that is associated with your provocative truth telling, you're probably not doing it right. And you're probably using that. It's like that pseudonymity is actually um, preventing the parisia from having its effects on the social fabric. And it's actually locking it up into this little box that's self-contained. And then that, 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 that uh, kind of antagonistic energy just circulates within its own little system. And it never really touches the social fabric. And that would be my, my hypothesis. Yeah, totally. That makes sense. Um, Cause you need to have a, you need to have skin in the game. That's right. right. You need skin in the game and you also need feedback loops, you know, to make sure that you're on track and if Absolutely. you have an avatar that's doing all of that work for you, you don't have that real interfacing with the real and incurring the actual social cost of, of being truthful. And I think maybe the problem with the question is that like, honestly, it's something you have to take responsibility for. There's no prescription for how to do this. It's like you have to do your own radical truth telling where you're incurring a kind of cost and see where that takes you. And uh, yeah, so I don't know. <laughs> Uh, those, great. those are very uh, precise on point additions to what I was saying. Uh, absolutely correct. I, I agree with all of that. Yeah. Um, memetic caper question. Would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess this is sort of almost what was just asked, but um, what happens when a uh, clinical parisia goes memetic? Uh, couldn't the countercultural and subcultural movements of the 60s and 70s be viewed this way? Uh, and also, isn't that what culture war is? Like, that's maybe one way of viewing culture war. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think that there is a consciousness, a self-consciousness from the very beginning that Parisia has a mimetic quality. The whole point of doing these kind of ridiculous performative truth-telling uh, actions that someone like Diogenes did was because he knew that it would percolate beyond him. Rumors would spread, right? Images and stories and anecdotes would spread well beyond him. I think he knew. I think he knew that very well. And that's something I mentioned at the beginning of my talk was that Diogenes had a very nice little phrase for what he was doing. He called it defacing the currency, and that's a really fascinating and rich label, I think, for this type of activity. Because what is currency? On some level, currency is mimetic, right? It's um, when you, when you. I think what he was basically trying to say was that any social order uh, basically has a set of values, right? And and those and those values are determined in part by all kinds of social nonsense, right? Um, who's valuable, who's popular, who's liked, who's not. There is a kind of um, hierarchy of social value, which is not at all founded in truth. And, and it's biased in many different ways, right? And uh, currency, like the, the capitalist economy, money as we know it, is, is part and parcel of this kind of arbitrary fake kind of value system, right? And, uh, but he, he seemed to believe that if one acts out the truth in this kind of profound way that causes a, that brings a cost on the performer or the speaker that in this weird way it has this ineluctable quality of decreasing the value of the fake currency in other words defacing the currency as we know it but of introducing a new type of value you might even cite nietzsche's transvaluation of values you might even put nietzsche in this tradition i think that would be quite reasonable um and and, and I think the, the essence of that mechanism, like why does that work, how does that work, is essentially what we now call memetics. Um, so that would be my, my, my best shot at an answer to that question. Yeah, that was, that was good, thanks. Thank you.
Excellent. Uh, Tyson, would you like to unmute yourself and share your story? Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, so my story is this morning I actually recorded a video um, sort of directed towards some of the things I've been thinking and feeling about the, you could say like the mimetic tribe of the Great Awakening. It's like QAnoners, anti-Bill Gates. I have a lot of like people of this um, mindset in my, my circle, my past friendships and all of this. So my video was directed toward them and it was things I knew would be triggering to people, people that I even know personally and like respect and love as people might think I'm talking directly to them and get upset. And so I recorded this and it helped me get a lot of clarity in my thinking and that felt good to really have the process of thinking for myself and express some of my thoughts. And then I chose not to share the video simply because um, I knew a lot of my motivation for then posting it was like this excitement of the drama that it might stir up. And then also the people that would like affirm me and be like, yeah, like we're on your side, we like this. And so I think what this is helping me do is like just, I want to refine sort of my internal compass of what to share, when to kind of rein it back and just keep it to my own process. Um, and then also connecting this with, we had Brad Blanton on yesterday talking about radical honesty. Um, so yeah, I'm just curious a, a little bit about that, like your internal compass for, you know, when is it, when do you feel that call where there's like a responsibility to, to share and to express that truthfulness? Or when do you find yourself like sort of reining it back and keeping it to yourself? Hmm. It's a great question. Really great question. I mean, I, I, I would never pretend to be able to give advice on this sort of thing. So uh, this is a type of question every person irreducibly has to answer for themselves. So with that as an important caveat, I can tell you uh, certainly a bit about my thought processes and how I think about that, but I, I would never want to give this as advice because these are essentially existential puzzles. You know, these are essentially decisions that individuals have to make in the, in the dark without, without any kind of guardrail and different people's situations are going to be very different. But what I would say is one thing I thought about listening to your story is that I think it's a, it's a, it's a very healthy instinct to think, um, you know, after you make a video or after you write something to think, you know, am I doing this for the right reasons? And if, and if you fear that maybe you're doing it for the wrong reasons to, to hold fire, that's, that, that's certainly an honorable thought process. But on the other hand, I sometimes think about everything I'm talking about as a way of kind of channeling some of the base desires that we have, not based, but base, you know, the lower appetites and the lower desires that we have. I, I wonder if the, the kind of philosophy I'm developing here is, is a way of channeling our base animalistic desires or appetites in a way that is productive. So for instance, I mean, when I, sometimes when I make videos, when I write blog posts or when I tweet stuff or whatever, I definitely can feel a kind of lust for the drama, a lust for the reaction. Uh, I find it fun, of course, and and I want that. And I would be lying if I said that wasn't a, a motivator for me. Um, but my my answer to that is that we are essentially animals, and we do have base base desires and base appetites. And I think part of life is the kind of spiritual practice of reining those in, um, of course, and controlling them, and 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 not being a victim uh, of your of your appetites or base desires. But they're not going to ultimately go away. And if you have this kind of perverse drive to literally stamp them out, you're just going to be a, a, one of those like terrible morbid Christians uh, who, uh, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a bad path. That that's, that's the incorrect. In many ways, it's even a sin. It's like scrupulousness. So there are ways of being like too morbid and too Christian such that it's actually a sin in its own right. Um, and, and so I think that there is actually a way of just kind of owning up to your base desires. And of course, we want a little drama. Of course, we want a little bit of excitement. We want adventure. We want a little bit of recognition as human beings, as thinkers, as, as whatever. And I think if you're, okay, so the, I'll just wrap that up by saying the key ultimate criteria that I always go back to is really just one thing. Everything begins and ends with this one thing is, do you really believe what you're saying is true? If you do, you really can't go wrong putting it out there. You can, you can cause all kinds of damage to your life and inconvenience and, and difficulties for yourself and your family and friends, for sure. But when it comes down to, is it the right thing to do ultimately? If you really believe what it, you're saying is true or what you're writing or speaking is true, it's never, ever, ever wrong to put it out in public. That's what I believe. That's, that, that's what I always default to. Thank you very much. Yeah, definitely. I would say too that, and I'll just throw this in, I guess, is that like the, 
the idea that uh, you, you have to take a risk, right? But you're also incurring a cost by creating drama, like what you're saying, Justin, when you have your face on it and it's your friends and that you're stirring up all of this with, it's not just attention that you're getting, you're getting a lot of inconvenience. And that's like the feedback loop, that's the OODA loop. Like you change the environment that you're in, you get new feedback and you actually have to manage the, the drama. You have to figure out how to navigate it. And that in a way is actually like teaching you whether or not you were right, did you actually uh, truly believe this thing because if you do you're willing to fight for it and you're willing to put the work in but if you are like shit I really wish I hadn't have done that uh, I don't feel like dealing with all of this that's a sign that maybe there's a misalignment um, and a kind of delusion but there's a theme that's coming up in the stoa about thinking in public and I think that this this is part of what you're talking about Justin as well uh, can I, have can I add one quick Mm -hmm. Practical thing to the, to the question I was just asked very briefly, um, unless you have a huge audience, by the way, none of your friends or family are ever going to care about what you say or be offended by it. I just wanted to add that. Um, like, I've, I mean, I, have a, I, I don't have a huge audience at all, but I have a decent audience, and I've been saying pretty wild stuff for a long time, and I've never once had an actual friend or family member ever come to me with anything that I made or said and uh, feeling upset or or anything like that. Uh, there have been a couple times where like something I said blew up and went viral and, and people in my life have heard about that and then maybe asked me about that. But um, short of that, and, and that's very rare, um, you know, you don't have to worry about some blog post or some video actually making its way to any of your friends and family. In fact, if anything, the problem you'll experience will be, why are none of my friends or family ever even hearing about this or caring about this? <laughs> Uh, Justin, I have a question and I'm not exactly sure how to approach it, uh, but it does kind of get back to this dispositional thing. So, you know, uh, there, there tends to be dispositional differences in men and women and women tend to not be as uh, oriented around risk taking. And I'm kind of wondering about uh, what do you think about bringing women into this? I, I know that there are some figures out there uh, like like Ayla is a great example of a woman who just like t speaks the truth. But how do we get women to take on this idea of like speaking truth to power and just exposing themselves when there is risk involved and there may be a tendency to be more risk averse in general? It's a good question. It's a very good question. Probably a better question for a woman to answer. But I, my instinct is I don't see any particular need for any type of positive project or intervention to increase the proportion of women doing this sort of thing. I'm, uh, if, if that's something you're interested in, then I, I support you and you should try to figure that out. But I don't see, I don't see any reason why um, any kind of gender inequality on, on who's doing this. I don't see it as necessarily being a problem. Um, yeah. It probably does uh, select for this type of activity probably does select for, for men. Um, but as you said, there will be women who, who do it too, for sure. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't really, I don't really see why you would need to correct that imbalance personally, but um, I mean, if probably if you wanted to do that, if that was something you're interested in, it would probably just be a matter of uh, developing this philosophy in a, a, a kind of language that uh, is more a tradition that women are interested in, right? So I'm sure there are feminine, I'm sure you could tell the historical narrative I told through women, right? I mean, I'm sure they exist. Um, uh, but as I said, the, the tradition or the lineage I tried to paint for you today is, is sort of subterranean enough. Uh, finding the the female equivalent of of this tradition, which I'm sure exists on some level, uh, is probably even more sub subterranean. But it might be a good research agenda, and uh, by illustrating that and showing how it works, that could very well uh, bring uh, more women into the fold of this type of experimentation, perhaps. Great. Maybe I'll get on that project. <laughs> That'd be cool. Let, <laughs> let me know if you do for sure. I will. Okay, we have one more question here, and I'm going to read it out loud uh, for this for Brent. Uh, okay, so this is what he's saying in the comments. I agree with everything you, Justin, are saying in theory. In fact, I offered to Peter to do a stoa on cynicism, kinicism, before I knew you were doing one. But I see you as somewhat of a left reactionary, and you even identify as libertarian. But I think you are no Socrates and have limited social solidarity and concern. So my question is, why are you averse to mass politics, particularly the Bernie Sanders movement, which at its core is about uh, Parisia. Hmm. So there's a lot there. I'll, I'll start with kind of just the end bits, which is that I'm not against mass politics. I, I just believe that mass politics is essentially at odds with uh, true philosophy or, or, or truth telling or even true science, uh, any type of truth seeking and mass politics 
are, are at odds. If you are going to play a game of mass politics, you are going to be lying in one way or another. Now, ex with maybe just the, the indirect exception of kind of reframing this kind of clinical politics I'm talking about, you can reframe it as a kind of mass action, right? Because I am ultimately interested in how can truth-telling individuals create desirable ripples in the social fabric. So in that, way, in that way, I am still interested in mass politics. I am still interested in essentially revolutionary politics. I'm interested in overthrowing institutions. I really am. I'm interested in overthrowing this rotten false order that, that defines our, our life today. Uh, it's, it's been one of my abiding interests and passions ever since I came of age is figuring out how to overthrow all of this, all of this that's so rotten. Uh, so in that sense, I remain highly invested and highly interested in a kind of mass politics. But what most people mean by mass politics, like organizing other people to try to change something, um, it's just at its core, it's going to require a certain amount of lying as I tried to kind of sketch earlier. And I don't think that's necessarily bad. I think that's a part of life for sure. Um, but if you're, if you're pursuing a kind of intellectual vocation, then you can't engage in that kind of mass politics is, is my short answer to that kind of long question. I, I know I'm kind of ignoring some parts of the question, but I just kind of chose to respond to what I uh, most immediately had something to say about. Great, thank you. I'm curious if Brent has a follow up to that. Yeah, sure. me too. No, no? Okay, I was just shaking his head. Okay. okay. Uh, do we think we can get this last question in? Uh, Justin, if it runs over a little bit at the hour, are you okay? I'm fine, no problem. Cool. Okay, great. Uh, so, Michael, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Sure. Uh, maybe I can give you guys a, a bit more background. Um, one sec, I try to put the video. Yeah, so um, I'm actually teaching a course at uh, Polytechnic Montreal in innovation management, and I'm, I'm in front of that challenge of um, trying to tell to a bunch of people, um, you know, that their future is compromised. You know, like uh, I'm, I'm always, you know, like having that dilemma of how can I get the message through? How can I, how can it, uh, you know, how I can deliver something in such a way that uh, the audience will get it, digest it, and do something about it. And not just, you know, having that uh, barricade of preconceived beliefs, um, you know, that, that won't make the message effective. And I, uh, like the, the way that I, I thought about it was to try to make activities in, in such a way that they would, um, you know, find information themselves and make their own conclusion. Um, I would like to hear your thought on that. Well, my instinct is to try to think of something you can do in your actual personal life that incurs a cost for you and then share that with them or tell them about it or bring it up or find some way to work that in. Because I think ultimately that that's one of the real concrete lessons of this presiastic or clinical tradition is that unless, unless you can materialize and embody your ideas, in some kind of way that you're willing to pay a price for, until you can do that, it's always going to be in this ethereal abstract realm of cheap talk. And I know this is hard, uh, depending on your situation and your context, the, there may very well not be any particularly obvious ways of doing this. I, so I recognize it's not necessarily the most uh, easy or, or practical advice for some people in certain situations. But then again, I also think there are many ways to do this. There, there are, it, it's not impossible to come up with even small ways, right? Um, in some ways, like, in some ways, uh, the practice of kind of vulnerability is kind of a low level example of this. Maybe, maybe this is something people in this crew are kind of uh, into. Um, you know, every time you, if you're giving a lecture in a classroom or you're presenting yourself or addressing yourself in, in any context, any time that you kind of drop the guard a little bit and you share something that most people wouldn't really want to share, uh, in any, in any time you do that, any, any time you kind of give that gift of, of vulnerability, it's a kind of self-sacrifice. It's a kind of paying a cost. It's like volunteering to pay a cost. And that almost always produces an effect of being more trustworthy, of actually touching people, of actually making them wake from their slumber and think, huh, this guy must be for real. Um, and, and I think that's, so, so that, that would be my, my kind of high level suggestion of looking for ways to incur a cost and then conveying that. I think it really does just put 
everything you're saying onto a new level. But even if you can't something, if you, even if you can't do something grand like masturbate in public, you can at least find some way to be vulnerable uh, or something like that in your in your everyday interactions to make them kind of more radical and real. Cool. Well, here we are at the end. Thank you so much, Justin. This was so juicy. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm genuinely very grateful to be here and I'm delighted. I'm always delighted. I love talking. I love to have an opportunity to share my ideas. So thank you. All thanks to you guys and gals. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, I want to invite anybody who wants to stay for half an hour afterwards to talk about this. I certainly have a lot of ideas, so I would love to hear like from the audience. So that's an invitation. Awesome. I'll hang around for a little bit. I have a meeting in like a half hour, but I'll hang around for a little bit. I'm just going to get a little bit of water then. I'll be right back. Cool. Sick. Um, so uh, before I press uh, stop recording, let's make a few announcements and then we're gonna have like a 30 minute making, uh, sense making session. Uh, so before the announcements, Justin, my friend, beautiful. Thanks for coming on. Let's do it again. Um, Thank you, Peter. And, and we do like cool things here, like Socratic speed dating, um, like Raven actually designed that. We're the speed dating method with the Socratic inquiry. So I'm, I'm very interested for some kind of cross pollination with the indie thinkers and the STOA. So maybe we can jam about that uh, another time. Um, cool. Upcoming events, uh, the Shame Breakthrough, uh, 6 p.m. with AJ Vaughn is happening. And uh, I just was, I interviewed actually Dave Fuller on behalf of Rebel Wisdom uh, about the conspiracy theory narrative that's coming online with QAnon and how to navigate that for him as a sense-making journalist. So you can check that out. That just got released. It's pretty cool. And he's coming on Tuesday at 1 p.m. to discuss that with us here. Uh, and the STOA is based off a gift economy. If you're inspired to provide a gift uh, to the STOA or myself as a steward, just go to the www.stoa slash gift. Uh, all right, everyone. Thank you so much. Boom.